of sort of the monotony of it. He felt like there's more to life than sort of just um, sort of hedonistic pleasures. And he goes back to the caterpillar pillar. So he goes back to the caterpillar pillar and he's like, well, I'm going to get to the top. At least it gave me purpose. And so he does it, right? He, he fights everybody. He kicks everybody out. Doesn't care. Just ruthless. Everybody's falling out. And then eventually he, he gets to the top and he sees... You know, uh, uh, he gets to the top and there's like one guy up there and he sees a moment where he can knock him off and bam, knocks him off and he flies off the caterpillar pillar and now he's on top. But once he was on top, he realizes that it was pointless. Who cares? The only reason he wanted to be on top because everybody else wanted to be on top. But once he was on top, there was nothing there. What was the point of being there? The only reason he liked being there is because everybody else wanted to be there. Um, you know, everybody below him wanted to be where he was at. And uh, while he was sitting there climbing up this caterpillar pillar, the yellow caterpillar cocooned herself and then turned into a butterfly, right? She turned into a butterfly and flew over the caterpillar pillar. So it shows that there's different paths to getting to the top, right? You can climb over everybody and be crappy to as many uh, caterpillars as yourself. And um, and then that gets to the top. But she's flying as a butterfly. To get to the top, she isn't like getting to the top over of anybody else, even though she was. She just, you know, was a butterfly, so she was flying. So, um, yeah, it's absolutely remarkable. The um, it's a good story, you know. It's just about it kind of it shits all over capitalism, keeping up with the Joneses, right? Uh, everybody else wants this and that, and the nicest game, the coolest thing. Uh, but really, what's what's it all matter? You know, what's the point of it all? So, hope for the flowers. I think it's by Trina. Trina Paulus, Paula or something like that. But check it out. It's a good, it's mostly illustrations, a quick read. And uh, and it should provoke some type of dialogue, right? It's about life and love, and it's about revolution. It's about revolution. Uh, chapter 1 in Maniac McGee. Okay, this is my, I, I had to say this is my all-time favorite book. And I remember actually at Spalding University, there was a woman that had talked about Maniac McGee. And I talked about how much I loved it. But there is no real conversation. It's just, you know, uh, dictatorship and uh, people are just... God, the teachers are such assholes. I swear to God. they Those who can't teach, they have no skills. They have no real value in society. So that's why they got to be like the king, right, and the little prince. They just give orders to make themselves feel important, but they're not actually doing anything. If anything, they're destroying that person's soul and what it is that they want out of life. So Maniac McGee is written in 1990 by Jerry Spinelli. Maniac McGee would run on the train tracks in between the West Enders and the East Enders. And the East Enders are black folks and West Enders are the white folks. And he didn't understand why anybody was calling each other white and black, right? He didn't see the colors. So I'm just going to start reading from chapter 1. They say Maniac McGee was born in a dump. They say his stomach was a cereal box and his heart a sofa spring. They say he kept an 8-inch cockroach on a leash and that rat stood guard over him while he slept. They say if you knew he was coming and you sprinkled salt on the ground, he ran over it within two or three blocks, he would be as slow as everybody else. They say, what's true, what's myth, it's hard to know. Finsterwald's gone now, yet even today, you'll never find a kid sitting on the steps where he once lived. The little league fence is still there in the band shell. Cobble's Corner still stands at the corner of Hector and Birch. And if you ask the man behind the counter, he'll take the clump of string out of a drawer and let you see it. Grade school girls at two mills still jump rope and they chant, Maniac, maniac, he's so cool, maniac, maniac. Don't go to school, runs all night, runs all right. Maniac, maniac, kiss the bull. And sometimes the girl holding one end of the rope is from the west end of Hector, and the girl on the other end is from the east side. And if you're looking for Maniac McGee's legacy or monument, that's as good as any, even if it wasn't really a bull. And that's okay because the history of a kid is one part fact, two parts legend, and three parts snowball. And if you want to know what it was like back when Maniac McGee roamed these parts, well, just run your hand under your movie seat and be very careful not to let the facts get mixed up with the truth. Maniac McGee was not born in a dump, he was born in a house, a pretty ordinary house, right across the river from here in Bridgeport. And he had regular parents, a mother and a father, but not for long. One day his parents left him with a sitter and took the P&W high speed trolley into the city. On the way back home, they were on board when the P&W had its famous crash, when the motor man was drunk and took the high trestle over the Shula Kill River at 60 miles an hour and the whole caboodle took a swan dive into the water. 
And just like that, Maniac McGee was an orphan. And he was only three years old. But of course, to be accurate, he really wasn't Maniac then. He was Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lionel McGee. Little Jeffrey was shipped off to his nearest relatives, Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan. They lived in Hollidaysburg in the western part of Pennsylvania. Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan hated each other, but because they were strict Catholics, they wouldn't get a divorce. Around the time Jeffrey arrived, they stopped talking to each other, then they stopped sharing. Pretty soon, there was two of everything in the house. Two bathrooms, two TVs, two refrigerators, two toasters. If it were possible, they would have had two Jeffreys, as it were. They split him up as best as they could. For instance, he would eat dinner with Aunt Dot on Monday, with Uncle Dan on Tuesday, and so on. Eight years of that. Then came the night of the spring musical at Jeffrey's school. He was in the chorus. There's only one show and one auditorium, so Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan were forced to share at least that much. Aunt Dot sat on one side, Uncle Dan on the other. Eventually, he runs away. More about Maniac McGee coming up. So Maniac McGee had an indelible impression on me, and I'm absolutely glad that I read this book, and I'm, I love it, okay? Uh, it's... I feel like Maniac McGee, and I think that's what these books are kind of written for. Coming of age book. I remember reading um, Maniac McGee in the third or fourth grade at Crinton Mount Zion. So another book from Grant County. Grant County really inundated me with a lot of good ideas, and I I don't even remember the teacher's name, you know. And I I appreciated all this because um, I really took this to heart. So Maniac McGee. As for the first person to actually stop and talk with Maniac, that would be Amanda Beal. And it happened because of a, a mistake. It was around 8 in the morning and Amanda was heading for grade school like hundreds of other kids all over town. What made Amanda Beal different was that she was carrying a suitcase. And that's what caught Maniac's eye. He figured she was just like him running away, so she stopped and said, Hi, Amanda Beal was suspicious. Who is this white, strange kid? And what was he doing in the East End? Where almost all the kids were black. And why was he saying hi? But Amanda Beal, Amanda Beal was also friendly. So she stopped and she said hi back. So, you know, then a relationship uh, uh, blossoms from that. Um, and, but that's sort of the racism that he's, you know, he's a runaway kid. He's a poor white kid. And then all he's doing is saying hi. And immediately she's kind of like, who in the hell are you to be saying hi to me? <laughs> and, um... Yeah, so that's just some racism, right? So, um, which he doesn't understand. So, let's continue on. I just got a bunch of quotes. I'm just going to read through all these quotes, okay? So, the Cobras were standing at Hector Street. Hector Street was the boundary between the East and West Ends, or to put it another way, between the Blacks and Whites. Not that you ever saw a White in the East End or a Black in the West End. People did cross the line now and then, especially if there were adults and it was daylight. But nighttime, forget it. If you're a kid, day or night, forget it. Unless you had business on the other side, such as a sports team or school, but don't be lust strolling around, or don't be lust. Don't be just, I copy and pasted this, so that's why. Uh, but don't just be, uh, don't be just strolling along as if you belonged there, as if you weren't afraid, as if you didn't even notice that you were a different color from everybody around you. So again, more racism. This is perfect for Louisville. Man, I've had so many experiences. I've been around poor whites, poor Mexicans, poor blacks. I just feel like I'm sort of an amalgamation of so many different uh, uh, cultures out here. And, um, and and I've experienced, you know, it's it's frustrating. It's frustrating to, to reject sort of white supremacy and then to run into black supremacy. And it's kind of like... There is no fucking difference between you assholes. You guys are both fucking ignorant fucking racists. You're prejudiced and you're shitheads. And, um, and there's institutional racism, which is important to understand, and it's important to understand white privilege. Uh, uh, but it's uh, when you go to combat racism, what, when you think about it, when you work it all through, what you want to do, you want to you want to stop the institutional racism, of course, but you actually want to change people's minds. You want to change people's hearts and minds, and that's where integration had came from. The only way you're going to change people's hearts and minds is get people to interact with each other to stop being a racist piece of shit. And um, and even though I think white culture, about ten to twenty percent, are still racist bigots, white supremacist assholes, and white people did start it. So I think it's up to white people. There's it's more up to white people to to stop it. The majority of white culture, I think, really looks down on it. I mean, look at Paula Dean. Paula Dean, she was, you know, totally, she was scapegoated and treated like shit. Marge shot. Um, you've had uh, that uh, 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 caca guy. That um, any caca. Um, I don't know. Some some politician who sort of made a 
kind of ra- I guess it was a racist um, remark. And then they, they lose their job. They lose their position, right? You had um, Kramer, which, you know, that was pretty clear. And then you also had that one guy with the cowboy hat. Um, he said nappy-headed hoes. Those are some nappy-headed hoes. <laughs> and he got fired, too. So the general white culture it doesn't tolerate. It doesn't put up with white supremacy. White supremacists are, are fucking ignorant and stupid. Nobody, in fact, somebody said that that's how you call a white person the N-word, okay? They said that there's no actual... Um, uh, 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 you know, equal correlation, but the way you call a white person inward, you call them racist. You racist piece of shit. You're racist. No, I'm not. I swear, I'm not racist. <laughs> and um, and so that's in that's in white culture. That's in white culture not to be racist like that. There is white privilege and there is institutional racism which needs to be worked on. But well, how do we work on that? What do we do? You know what I mean? Like we got there's affirmative action programs, there's reparations, and there's good ideas here. But if you don't really, I mean, God. I'm even thinking about this. People, I talked about reparations, and I was like, oh, I just saw black poverty for you, but she was such a fucking asshole. A black woman who was just treating me like a total dick, light-skinned black woman who talked very white, very obedient to her, you know, her, her massa, and, um, and yet I was an intellectual slave sitting next to her, and it seems like the slaves are more likely to hit one another than they are to actually unite and, and, and um, you know, overthrow the oppressor and, and get their freedom. So, it's just that's that's a frustrating thing because when I'm saying, well, I don't recognize white people, uh, you know what they do. Even though I, I talk about white privilege, I talk about uh, reparations, and I talk about caring about black people, I don't see a lot of white people saying that. So even though they say I'm not racist, um, that's you know that's not enough, right? You got to do a little bit more. Um, but how much more, right? Do I have to be? whipped into slavery? Am I just supposed to jump off a bridge? I felt like if I was to listen to her advice about life, I'm working class and by myself out here. So if I was to listen to this woman who was giving me shit in this class, and that's also another thing. I got $30,000 running on this education. Yeah, I would have liked to speak, uh, spoke plainly to her. She was like, yeah, I know you have a black grandpa in African DNA, but uh, that doesn't make you black. And um, and yeah, yeah. I mean, that's of course that's true. Clearly, the my point was uh, the one drop rule in 1910 Tennessee. The uh, white people said if you had one drop of black in you, you're out of the white race, right? You're out. And so, according to them, I would be black, but you know, I have this this color. I do have 11 percent African blood in me, so that's way more than just one drops. That means something. Actually, it means more something to me than anything else because as a white person, I felt like it was just a nothingness. It just means you're like everybody else. And who am I? They, I was once told I was German, but that didn't mean nothing to me. Nobody gave a shit. Basically, uh, people that I had been raised with, they just were white and were better than everybody else. So, I get that. There's, I, I was raised around Confederates and like they were racist for no apparent reason whatsoever. In fact, the leaders of the my cousins who were racist have brown skin. They 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 might be like partially Mexican or Native American, maybe even black, like maybe just they've had, you know, enough white that dulled it down. And maybe that's where it came from. They went to school and some of the white racists there was calling them Mexicans. I'm not a Mexican. I hate Mexicans and I hate all the, you know, black people too and and and, and I'm a racist. Ha ha ha. And that's how, you know, that's how I think it they developed. And um, yet, I've also met a black dude who was like, oh, niggers stink and they smell bad and shit on niggers and white people are so good and they're so nice. And he talked more racist than I've ever heard any Confederate. And they're like Confederate light, right? They haven't killed anybody. They don't, they're not not riders. They're not oppressing anybody. Basically, just a bunch of white boys who don't know what else to fucking talk about. So let's hate on somebody else, and that unifies them because they don't know what else to unify. They have no good examples, and plus, their parents are fucking racist pieces of shit. And another thing, on top of all this, the kids that I was raised with were children of farmers. They were the slaves out in the fields. They were the field Negroes, you know? They're the ones having to do the damn work to make somebody else rich for no money, no pay, no wages, no rights, nothing. From can't see in the morning to can't see at night. So while they're sitting there hating on black people about slaves, I remember another one, Robert. Robert Lemming, he was sitting there talking about how he added black people, the black people, the worst fucking people in the world, and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And I was trying to kind of talk to him about it, and then he was like, 
I was like, well, I think, you know, people allowed to be what they want. This, I remember when I was real young, and I feel bad for conceding this, but he was so much older than me. Um, but he had said, uh, well, uh, well, then we should at least send him back to Africa. And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, like, what the fuck ever. And he's like, wouldn't it be nice to have slaves? Wouldn't that be nice? Like, uh, like we're, we were the slaves. And we were on the fucking tobacco centers talking about this. We were the fucking slaves. 